Welcome all to tonight's program, Behind the Scenes of West Coast Museums. My name is Jessica Levin Martinez. I'm the Richard J. Schwartz Director of the Herbert F. Johnson Museum at Cornell University. And I wanna thank your West Coast Alumni Affairs and Development team for bringing us all together tonight. But you know, before we begin, I wanna acknowledge that so many of our alumni and friends are impacted by the fires in your region. And we're thinking about you from Ithaca. I wanna share, and I wish I could actually share it with you. It's a kind of crisp and clear fall night here. And we're delighted tonight to offer you a kind of behind the scenes look of you at SF MoMA, the Seattle Art Museum and the Getty through the eyes of Cornelians who are just driving those institutions, each of them former Johnson Museum of Art interns and students. So tonight, soon you'll hear from Janet Bishop, Chief Curator at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, Natalia Di Pietrantonio, the Assistant Curator in Southern Asian Art at the Seattle Art Museum, America Castillo on the curatorial team in architecture and design department at SF MoMA, and Beth Morrison. She's the senior curator of manuscripts at the J. Paul Getty Museum. How fantastic is that? So we're going to start. They'll give short presentations, then join me for, I think it will be a lively conversation. The entire time, starting now, you can ask us all questions please use the Q&A feature. We're not gonna use chat tonight, so just the Q&A. And as the questions come to you, fill them right in. So, but before we get started, and I know we're anxious to do that, I'm so anxious to share with you a little kind of update on what's new at the Johnson Museum in this very unusual time. So we're just thrilled that students are indeed back on campus and looking at original works of art. And as ever, we're a site for interdisciplinary teaching and object-based learning. As with all campus facilities in Ithaca, we are closed to the general public. So we're serving entirely for the first time in 47 years, Cornell faculty, staff, and students. So we're really calling on our 40,000 work strong global collection to serve Cornell classes. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Please check out our website for all of our um, virtual programs. We're teaching public and rural schools locally, but as far as California and Seattle and beyond too. So join us for that and there'll be more time to discuss. So that's a quick view, a kind of view from the top of the slope from your academic museum. So Janet Bishop, if you could start in with our presentations, that would just be terrific. Thank you so much, Janet. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Um, I am Chief Curator at, at SF MoMA, as Jessica mentioned in her introduction, and I am an Arts and Sciences graduate of Cornell, um, class of 1985. And I just wanted to thank you, Jessica, and the team who put this together um, for convening us um, under very smoky western skies out here. Um, it's honestly really terrific to have the distraction of, of such a nice event, um, so thank you. Um, Career-wise, I would say that my experience as an intern at the Johnson Museum during my senior year at Cornell and full-time in the summer afterwards really had everything to do with the path um, that I have taken. I had been enjoying art, art history classes um, and uh, double majored in art history and psychology. But when I started at the Johnson, it became really apparent to me how much I absolutely loved working with objects and also how much I loved the inher inherently collaborative nature of museum work. Um, I worked in public relations, writing press releases and radio spots for upcoming exhibitions. And then afterwards I worked in the print room. And I'd say it also didn't hurt that in both of those um, office spaces, I had spectacular views of Cayuga Lake. So that was, um, that was very special. 
um, and made going to work even you know that much more more pleasurable. So after finishing at Cornell, I I earned a master's degree at Columbia and then uh, worked with a couple of different collections before returning to the Bay Area um, where I grew up. And I started at SFMOMA as a curatorial assistant shortly thereafter um, when our museum was still located in its original building um, from 1935 um, in the Civic Center area of, of the city. Um, so my slides relate to a long planned exhibition featuring the paintings of the artist David Park. Um, Park was a Boston native who moved to California as a teenager. Um, and in right around 1950, um, he took as many of his abstract expressionist paintings as he could stuff into the back of his car um, to an East Bay dump. Um, he felt like his abstract work was the, a reflection of a hardworking guy who was trying to look important, but it really didn't feel authentic to him. And he returned to a subject that he had, he had enjoyed um, since he was a little kid, which was the human figure. And, uh, and really became the, um, the originator of the movement uh, we know as Bay Area figurative art, um, inspiring artists, for instance, such as, such as Richard Diebenkorn and Elmer Bischoff and others. Um, I wanted to mention that even though I grew up out here um, on the San Francisco Peninsula, I actually first learned about Bay Area figurative art um, and wrote about it uh, via a class at Cornell. And it's been one of my areas of focus as a curator ever since. Um, so when SF MoMA reopens to the public, hopefully in just a couple of weeks, um, there should be an announcement about this imminently uh, as we've gotten an all clear from the city and, and the health department. Um, hopefully, uh, so hopefully we'll, we'll be opening soon. And, um, and when we do, Park will be among our new offerings. Um, the show opened at the Fort Worth um, Museum of Art and then traveled to the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts and right at the end of the Kalamazoo presentation um, we went into shelter in place and so the entire exhibition basically sheltered in place in Chicago in storage um, before being trucked out here and we installed it in July and August um, in anticipation of this moment of reopening. And what you see here is the entrance to the exhibition. You can still see there's a few carts and stanchions around. We're not quite, we weren't, we weren't quite finished um, with it then, but, but the people in the foreground um, are David Park's family. Um, his daughter on the left and, and his granddaughter, and then on the right hand side, um, his great, great nephew and, and niece. Um, and we, uh, we had them in a couple of weeks ago for, uh, for a sneak peek. Um, so in the next slide, see us at work on the final gallery of the exhibition. Um, Park, the retrospective covers Park work, Park's work um, uh, from the 1930s uh, until 1960 when he died young um, at the age of 49. So it covers the full trajectory of his career and what you see here is what is to my mind an extraordinarily special body of work. Um, these are examples of about a hundred gouaches that Park made in the last year of his life when he was too ill um, to work uh, on canvas at an easel. He made these um, uh, while, while propped up um, in bed, really one or two on any given day, um, reiterating all of the subjects that had been important to him throughout his career. So musicians and bathers and rowers and mothers and children. Um, it's a deeply humanist body of work. Um, I really hope you're, you're able to visit. We expect that it will be on view until, um, until January of early next year. Um, among other uh, new projects, um, including a series of mural commissions um, for, uh, for, the, for the interior walls of our building. Um, we're working with local artists on that. I'm really excited about it. Um, and I just wanted to add, um, before I pass the, the word to the next speaker, that, um, that the Johnson Museum and Cornell um, remain very close to my heart. Um, I'm honored to have served on the Johnson Museum's Advisory Council for the last so, seven or eight years now. And I have a 2020 Cornell graduate. 
Um, my last trip before the shutdown in February was to visit her and also to, uh, to see the debut of a new um, uh, photography show at the Johnson. Uh, and, um, and it was a blizzard um, in February. And, uh, and, and the last trip that I took before, um, before shelter in place. Um, I'm just so impressed always by what, uh, by what the Johnson Museum is doing. And at this point, how, how adeptly um, the focus of the program has shifted to accommodate the needs of, of classes and students at this, uh, at this unusual time. So thanks so much. Um, and I will now pass the, um, the word to Natalia. So uh, thank you, Janet, and good evening, everyone. Hopefully you can see me because somehow my image is not coming through, uh, but it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Natalia, and I'm the inaugural curator of South Asian art at the Seattle Art Museum, commonly referred to as SAM. And as the previous slide showed, I'm class of 2018, uh, where I graduated with my PhD. So at SAM, I care for both the historical and modern contemporary works from South Asia, along with uh, the works that are housed in our Islamic galleries. And so before I dive into my role at SAM first, I want to acknowledge the impact that Cornell and then Johnson Museum had on my education and my career. So after having completed a master's at Columbia University, I entered my PhD in 2011 to concentrate on the historical modes of Indian paintings. Now, while at Cornell, my horizons expanded drastically, specifically with the exhibition held at the Johnson Museum and co-curated by one of my advisors, Professor Iftikhar Dadi. The show, Lines of Control, was groundbreaking in its mediation on global partitions and borders. It opened my world to contemporary art of South Asia. And on this slide, uh, you can see the catalog of Lines of Control and a work uh, by Iftikhar and artist uh, Nalina Malani titled Bloodlines. Secondly, Cornell, um, at Cornell, as many alumni are aware, has one of the strongest centers of Southeast Asia, which is known as the jewel and the crown of Cornell's academics. At Cornell, I worked closely with Professor Kaya McGowan and other SEEP faculty to expand my research into the arts of Indonesia. I had the excellent fortune to assist Kaya along with other students to co-curate the exhibition titled Shadow Play, held at the Johnson in 2011. And that's the bottom image in the slide. So Shadow Play, essentially a storytelling medium has been the most major vehicles for the transmission of the Mahabharata in Java and in Bali, Indonesia. We display textiles, shadow puppets, and other medium. And at that juncture, I learned how museums operated and the necessity of collaboration and teamwork in any museum sector, especially though for curation. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And now I just want to really briefly touch upon my experience at Seattle. I started my new position on July 1st in the midst of the pandemic, having moved from an academic position, which was in New York City. But I first moved to Seattle in mid-June to the neighborhood of Capitol Hill. Seattle and its neighborhood of Capitol Hill dominated the news over the summer for the erection of CHAZ, a Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, and as a home base for the Black Lives Matter movement. And that's the image on uh, the very left. You can see the mural that was painted in Capitol Hill. So to touch on this historical moment, Seattle Art Museum commissioned the artist Kamisha Turner to paint a mural on one of our boarded up windows in our downtown location. Turner's work, which depicts the little tears of the Black community, has now been permanently moved to the entrance of SAM, as you can see uh, in this slide as well. 
Sam is deeply committed to expanding our BIPOC initiatives and aiming to become an anti-racist institution. As a first-generation American and a first-gen college student, and as a proud Latina, I am committed to addressing structural racism, and I will use my role as curator to continue to advocate for artists uh, that are transnational and from the global south. And I just want to add that I wouldn't be in my position if it wasn't for the support of the Johnson Museum and for the wonderful advisors I had at Cornell. And now I would like to pass it on to America. See, hi. Um, thank you, Natalia. Um, hello, everyone. My name is America Castillo. I've been working at SF MoMA for two years now, and I work within the curatorial division as the department assistant for architecture and design. I got my BARC at Cornell in 2017. And then I kind of just stumbled into the world of museums, honestly. <laughs> I was originally attracted to the a and department specifically because our group works closely with design artifacts as well as with designers and architects that bring important topics to the public. And what I really loved about that was that I see that as a very unique type of engagement with design thinking that is not necessarily focused on producing objects necessarily, but more so on the impact that these have on people and in, on, on environments. Um, so since I've joined the museum world, I've been more and more involved with the curatorial practice as a whole, and I've been thinking a lot about how museums can implement that design mindset, so i.e. Um, adaptability, responsiveness into our everyday work. Um, so this first slide is representative of one of the longer projects that I've been involved with. Um, and it basically has been this continual process of thinking about um, the digital and more complex works in our collection and finding a way to capture all of the extensive research that actually happens when we acquire, care for, and display a work. Um, in a and we're pretty unique in that our collection is comprised of more than your traditional art formats. It includes digital works like the Macintosh you see here. And in 2016, SFMOMA began studying what it meant to display these types of objects within a museum setting where usually there's limited to no interaction with the objects at all, right? So as designers, we understand that the user experience and the mechanics of the work are essential parts of the design itself and that it must be conveyed in order to truly understand the work. So I've been exploring collaborative online platforms like MediaWiki, which that's a snapshot of, and um, thinking about how to gather this knowledge that we've gained through the process and share it potentially across institutions that face similar questions. And I also want to say that this is not something that is limited only to electronic works. It's also an opportunity that we have to cover more dynamic installations as well. So if we can move on to the next slide. Um, so this is a work by Tatiana Bilbao Estudio, which we just brought into the collection exactly one year ago. And Tatiana Bilbao is a Mexico City based architect who considers um, domesticity from policy to livability. And this work explores alternative visions of vertical living. Um, it's a very complex, tall structure made of many, many intersecting detailed models. And I wanted to show this image because I think it really shows how much effort can go into putting one work on view, even if it's just for one day. And like the designer of this work, I'm also Mexican. And uh, thanks to my architectural training, as well as the fact that I speak Spanish as a first language, um, I had a really special opportunity to help install this work for its acquisition proposal. Um, it took us a whole week. It was very long, hard work and very complex and delicate. But to this day, I can say it's probably one of the most exciting moments that I've had working at the museum so far. Um, and if we can go to the next slide, um, that work was only up that time for one day, <laughs> but fortunately it will be on view soon again to the public since our next show will be a solo exhibition focused on Tatiana Bilbao's architectural practice. Um, so this is a quick preview snapshot of the gallery as a 3D SketchUp model. And I also want to note that um, we were literally one week away from finishing the installation before the pandemic shut down all operations in San Francisco. So for me, this project is actually very representative of the moment 
environment that we're all living in. Um, I also wanted to include this digital model because um, I think it's it's not so often that you really get to see the behind the scenes mock-up versions of what actually ends up being in the gallery. Um, and since architectural modeling is one of the things that I did the most during my undergrad and after, I'm actually fairly involved um, often with helping our design team do pre the preliminary layouts and mock-ups of our exhibitions. Um, and then the next slide, so if, yeah, right now the galleries are closed, obviously, but we hope it won't be much longer. Um, and in the meantime, the museum has been going through a wave of changes um, from uncertainties regarding who will be working for how long and on what, um, at least in A&D, we've been really focusing our energy on digital projects that can especially thrive during a work from home era. So projects that we may have not had the bandwidth to collaborate on all together when we were on site. And I personally have a passion for applying design principles to very ordinary things. <laughs> and I especially love that design manifests itself, not just in a final product, but also in the processes. Um, so recently I've taken on any project to transform the way that we gather um, qualitative data about our acquisitions. So be a forms, questionnaires, sheets, um, and you're not expected to be able to read this at all. But um, I just want to make the point that um, I'm really passionate about turning these uh, things that are so ordinary into beautifully designed interactions that can be become part of our routine habits at the museum as well. And we're thinking about our practices as a whole and how we can encourage better, um, higher quality conversations that are also more equitable. And the reason why I wanted to show all of this is just um, to let anyone out there know that um, there's just so many ways of implementing design skills, technology skills, uh, interdisciplinary skills, which were at the core of what my degree at Cornell, but um, that I believe that are, continue to be pillars within AAP, but also in other departments at Cornell. Um, and I also want you to take away that there's no one path to museum work. Like in my case, it was very different. And I can say being in it now that we truly benefit from people with all kinds of backgrounds. So I'm happy to discuss that much further offline if anyone is interested in anything that I had to say and I will pass it on to Beth Morrison. Hi everyone. Um, first I just wanted to say how honored I am to um, share the conversation this evening with such wonderful colleagues from across the West Coast. I think West Coast museums really are making um, changes that will affect everyone in the museum industry. And oftentimes we have a little bit um, sort of more freedom to change than uh, some of the more established paces on the East Coast. Which brings me to me, um, Beth Morrison, Senior Curator of Manuscripts at the Getty Museum. I graduated with a PhD from Cornell in 2002 uh, in medieval manuscripts. And shockingly enough, um, I've been at the Getty now for 25 years in medieval manuscripts. Um, so I'm very grateful to Cornell for getting me such a great start into a fabulous career here at the Getty. Now, the Getty has sort of more unusual challenges because we are a museum that primarily collects European art before the year um, 1900. And so we have more challenges in terms, I think, of making our collections relevant, especially at this moment. But I think it's really important uh, to me as a curator to think about ways of engaging audiences in uh, the particular social moment that we're in that really help them understand the historical underpinnings of a lot of the social problems that we have today. So as an example, I want to talk about this exhibition, Power, Justice, and Tyranny in the Middle Ages. And this was actually an exhibition that was timed to go up before the general election in November. Of course, that's now been delayed and the Getty has announced um, publicly that we're not opening again until 2021. So this is an exhibition that we're hoping to put up on the Google Arts and Culture website so that people can look at this exhibition even though they won't be able to see it physically at the Getty. Um, so this is an exhibition that was conceived by uh, my entire staff, basically, all four curators on the staff, because we really wanted to make a point about the historical underpinnings of some of the issues that we're seeing in governance today. And so, um, for instance, we can talk about political factions, we can talk about people um, being outsiders in the political sphere, bad advisors, um, sort of the breakdown of governance because of issues 
of tyranny. And even on the far right side of the screen, you'll see an image from an apocalyptic manuscript that talks about how bad governance can lead to the end of the world. And this particular page talks about fires consuming and scorching the earth, which of course couldn't be more appropriate for the exact circumstances that we find ourselves today in California. Uh, if you could just click to the next image. Um, I want to talk about how specific images I hope can have relevance for viewers in these types of exhibitions. This is a fabulous manuscript. It's actually the first acquisition under my watch as senior curator. And it's this wonderful sort of soap opera from the Middle Ages that has treason and kidnapping and mistaken identity and bigamy. And, you know, it's just like the medieval version of a soap opera. But in this particular image, we see see um, a scene about Julien de Troisigny, who's the hero of the story, and he actually went off on pilgrimage to Jerusalem and was captured uh, by Muslim captors in northern Africa. And what you see is his um, faithful companion, Herton, here in a green robe with red stockings, um, and he wants to free his master from captivity. So he actually dresses himself in blackface to confuse Julien's jailers, the king that you see sitting under the red curtain. And um, according to the story, he easily dupes all of the people at court and springs Julien from jail and they go off. But the sort of um, story reiterates for medieval white viewers that black people are inferior. And I think when people see this and they see that these ideas have lasted for centuries and centuries, it really underscores how deeply seated these issues of social justice are and why things like bias and um, and white superiority are so hard to eradicate from our society. Um, so I think these kinds of images, these kinds of exhibitions are really our duty as curators to bring to the fore um, for contemporary audiences to show them the relevance of historic art, um, not only how beautiful it is, but how it can speak to them. And then if you move to the next slide, um, I also want to talk about my friend Andy, who's the reason I think I'm here tonight. He must have suggested me. He is the um, Seymour R. Askin Jr. 47 curator of earlier European and American art at the Johnson. And I just wanted to say the Johnson is wonderful for its exhibitions, its programming, but to me, above all, its people. Um, Andy is a wonderful, innovative curator there, and I've known him for years. In fact, in 2002, when I graduated, he was the one who actually ran out and got my outfit so that I could have a cap and gown because I could only come in for the hours, actually, of the graduation. And I'll always remind, uh, remember his kindness on that occasion. But of course, we've known each other all the way back from 1993. And you can see in this image um, a, a, a sort of good times that we had at graduate school. But it's these kind of deep relationships with colleagues that you have all over the country that are so important and make our work so much fun and so interesting. And I'm delighted to have a chance to get to know my other colleagues out here on the West Coast whom I haven't known before. So now I'll hand it back over to Jessica. Terrific. I can't thank you all enough. You know, you're all... Um kind of future forward curators working in a time of climate crisis at a moment of a global pandemic. And as we all seek to advance our national conversation around um, a more equitable and just society and the role that museums can play within it. So we have a lot to discuss. So let's dig in. Let's just start and talk about, you know, you all brought up just, um, how organic it seems um, to move um, with the pandemic, to switch to digital, to change dates with the show. And I know that behind the scenes, it takes a lot of people to pull that off, right? That these um, pivots, our new kind of favorite word, are, are fraught and buried. Um, and so, um, Natalia, you're the only one of us um, working in a fully open museum to the public. Could you say a few words? It's, um, kind of lead off, share at Seattle, what does it take to reopen a museum? 
Well, we're partially reopened. Um, we have three sites. Uh, we are Encyclopedic Museum, so we have a very large collection. One that is open is the downtown, and we wanted to get that open because we had two special exhibitions, O'Keefe and O'Confra, which just closed down. We have the Olympic Sculpture Park, which is an outdoor setting, so that kind of is conducive. And the one that remains closed is the Asian Art Museum, which is primarily my home and base. Um, and so as you can even see what I'm speaking that it's very complicated and complex about when do you reopen. Of course, you need the approval. Health is the primary concern for everybody. And it just takes a teamwork of people, scientists, to confirm that, you know, it's all a go um, before we can go forward. And it also depends on the layout. For instance, the Asian Art Museum remains closed because of our casework and just, you know, having to navigate those bodies and those people around that space we think is still kind of a little bit dangerous, but we're trying to get, get more studies done to make sure we can reopen. So again, we're trying to be very flexible to the moment. And as you said, it is, it takes many months to even gear up. Uh, we had the downtown gear up months and months planned ahead. And then we had two weeks uh, to do it. And so I just, it's a teamwork effort. For sure. And Amerika, you talked about design thinking, right? So have you at SF MoMA applied that kind of approach internally among your staff to prepare? Yeah, I mean, I will say I'm very fortunate to be part of the architecture and design team, which in and of itself has designers, so I'm not the only one. Um, so in our team, it comes very easily to kind of have that mentality to begin with. But I do think um, across the board, across curatorial, we're always, you know, the first we're happy to take lead and in, in the more experimental kind of approach to solving problems uh, just because it, it it's just embodies how we think um, not just internally but how we have conversations with designers as well so whenever there's a problem like we're always happy to lead by example um, but yeah it's just in our nature I guess <laughs> I don't know what else to say <laughs> terrific terrific there's some um, of curatorial work at least we think about this when we're training Cornell students. We have about 25 undergraduates um, who work with us as interns every year. And we think about what is training um, and what is um, like a formal training versus a kind of apprenticeship, right? When is the tipping point of you done, you've practiced it so many times that you just know. And um, I would love to walk around a museum with all of you and see when you just know <laughs> what it, you know, the decisions you're making, the curatorial um, moves that you're making. But Beth, you know, you're, you're making a lot of curatorial moves in your major show that I assume is a loan show, right? So maybe you could unwind for us, for this, uh, for our listeners, what it takes to put together a major show like this, even in a pandemic, or even to unwind a show that isn't opening as you had planned? Um, you know, it's interesting. The, the thing about our collections is they're so light sensitive that we don't have a permanent display of manuscripts. We actually have four exhibitions a year. And this is one of those exhibitions solely drawn from the permanent collection. And so it was unusual actually in that it was all permanent collections. So we didn't have as much trouble actually delaying it as we would have normally. But I have to say that um, last year I did an exhibition um, uh, called um, Book of Beasts, which was about a medieval bestiary as an object. It had 45 lenders. And I have to say every morning I wake up thankful that it was this summer <laughs> and not last summer. It was an exhibition I'd worked on for 10 years. And if it had been at the exact same time that we had COVID, um, the entire exhibition would have been canceled because there's no way to reschedule 45 lenders. But as an extra sort of horrible thing, manuscripts are not just light sensitive, but they're also sensitive to being open. If you think about just putting a book open, um, we would have had to go in and close those books somehow. And some of the cases actually involve 
five different lenders with seven manuscripts. And I, it just gives me the heebie-jeebies to think about what it would have taken to try to dismount that exhibition during the middle of all of this. Of course, I'm very sorry for the curator at the Getty who had a show up this summer, but just by chance, it was a one lender exhibition. It was all drawings and we could simply cover them and they didn't have all those extra things. So please do, we are gonna remount Power, Justice and Tyranny um, in January, hopefully when we reopen. Um, and in the meantime, we will have it up online. So I hope people will have a chance to ex uh, experience it either virtually or in person. Terrific, terrific. And Janet, we know you're not just thinking about your projects. You're thinking about a whole team of curators in your role as chief curator. What does it look like right now to be a chief curator when schedules changing and exhibition kind of aspirations changing? Oh, you're still on mute. Thanks. Um, thanks, Jessica. Yeah, there, I mean, there are certain you know, practical issues that we had to address um, right away and, you know, practical decisions of, you know, things that were affected by, by the pandemic and uh, the restrictions on travel, on, on couriers. Our, our own curatorial staff is not traveling um, really until the end of the year. And, um, and you know, our, our collection um, is, you know, is frequently tapped by our colleagues, um, you know, throughout the world for loans. And we were starting to get um, you know, uh, email after email about projects that were being either canceled or delayed. And we were in the midst of organizing what we expect to, expected to be our, our major fall exhibition, which is a project called Diego Rivera's America. Um, and it was to be accompanied by the the move of a, an actual Diego Rivera mural from, um, from a site um, in San Francisco to our own uh, um, galleries in the, in the free zone of SFMOMA. And, um, and, you know, I would say, you know, maybe just a, a month or so ago, we made the really d difficult decision to, to postpone the exhibition by, um, and it's now slated for, um, for 2022, because we realized that we just were not going to be able to mount the exhibition that we, that we had envisioned um, with all of the loans that, that we had already arranged for the, for the show um, uh, successfully. And, um, and so you know, on, on top of that, our, our, the guest curator for the show is based in Mexico City. And at a time when none of us were traveling, we just couldn't expect him to come to San Francisco um, and, uh, and, and be here for the show. So, so we'll still be, um, we will still be uh, bringing the mural um, to the museum and that will be up long term. So instead of having the exhibition coincide with the, with the debut of the mural, it will coincide with, its, with, with the tail end of it. Um, and in the meantime, you know, we've been thinking as a team, as a division, and I work with a group of um, just about 30 people on what, um, you know, what, what are the most important things for us to be thinking about going forward. I mean, there's no question that um, that the heightened awareness, uh, you know, around systemic racism and its history in museums, and the, you know, the 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 heightened awareness of of racial injustice that was um, that was uh, that followed the, you know, the murder of George Floyd, George Floyd has has made it urgent for us to um, think about um, to think about uh, representation in our in our exhibitions and collections. Um, so that's been a, a I would say almost an all-consuming focus. Um, it isn't the beginning of SF MoMA's work on, on DEI issues and collection diversification. In 2019, we deaccessioned a 1960 Mark Rothko painting um, in order to make transformative acquisitions that would that would broaden our, our collection. And to date, with the deaccession of that single work, we've acquired um, around a hundred pieces from all um, disciplines, you know, ranging from historic works um, like paintings by Alma Thomas, or I love that America showed um, the slide of the Tatiana Bilbao acquisition. There was a little, um, there was a hint of a Sam Gilliam in the background. It was presented at that same meeting um, and now hangs um, in our gallery. So it's been an ongoing effort. And, and, uh, and I would say at, at this point, you know, it's, it's especially imperative that we, um, that we amplify black voices in our galleries and uh, and we've been working to you know to adjust um, 
and, and think creatively about our, our program going forward. And what a gesture for Seattle to commission a new work. You know, here, voice, voices from the artists at the moment of strife and peaceful protest when museums are, we're so used to being places where we gather and we have difficult conversations with and through great works of art, but the chance to actually invite an artist to make a new work um, that responds to our time. Natalia, can you say a few words about how that came to be? Was that, was a community involved in that? Or um, what was the, the thing that made it happen? I, again, it's uh, teamwork. I was kind of, you know, just entering, um, but I got to see it in action. So a large part is that the artist previously had worked with uh, Sam and in large part with our you, um, diversity, equity, inclusion um, director, Priya Frank, and she was also known to the staff. And so we had a donor, um, you know, generously donate some funds for us to just have the mural on the outside. And we had such a positive response to kind of people, you know, downtown had been particularly hard hit at Seattle. And so them walking up to the mural and having that experience, you want to capture that permanently in our collection. So again, um, the donors stepped up and helped us to allow us to have it permanently installed and just having conversation with the artist. Again, I think it's a very, um, we're leaning hard on BIPOC artists and black artists in particular to help us, um, you know, speak to the public. And we have to be cognizant of when maybe we're leaning too much on them, but she was very gracious um, in allowing us to keep her work. Yeah. These commissions now are incredibly delicate and all we do is political. And I would say at the Johnson Museum, we have such a, an interest in doing more and more with, uh, with contemporary artists coming to Ithaca, spending time with students and faculty, really taking advantage of Cornell's um, research abilities, capabilities, facilities to do something that could happen no place else. You know, we have the wonderful tradition from our 1969 Earth Art exhibit, the first American exhibit of works bound to their place. So this, you know, great tradition um, is, a, is a wonderful reminder and inspiration for us, I would say. Um, and, and two, also that Earth Art, you know, we've long thought about sustainability. Our next major show will be on climate change and indigenous artists. So given the fires all around, um, your work with conservation and others, I was wondering maybe Beth, you could say a few words about does climate change impact your work as a curator at the Getty? Um, I think it's just a fact of life now that is impacting all of us and will have to impact all of us moving forward. I'm, not sure if um, all of you might know about the fire that we had um, almost two years ago now um, that literally uh, all it had to do was cross the street to be on Getty property. Um, and it could have just raced up the hill. And, you know, we were all just sort of sitting at home waiting for updates like everybody else because, of course, we weren't allowed on site. Um, but it makes us very cognizant. Um, and, you know, the Getty is well prepared. I mean, they, you know, they have a way of sprinkling all the things. They hire goats to come in and nibble on the stuff around so that um, the underbrush doesn't get too big. And also all of our vaults where the manuscripts are stored um, have um, activated charcoal built into the walls so that any smoke or particulates that might get through into the vault itself don't get into the cabinets where the manuscripts are kept. So I think we all have to be cognizant of this moving forward. And, you know, as I said, even in medieval manuscripts, when, you know, we have plenty of fabulous um, apocalyptic imagery in our collection, and all of it has to do with the destruction of the earth at the end of time because of the way that people have cared for the earth. Whether you're Christian or not, it's a message that comes through for all of us and has come through for many centuries. And now we just all have to stand up and take acknowledgement of it. Mm, powerful, powerful. So, America, I guess I turn it to you with design and building new futures. What role does the museum have in building a new future when we think about our current? climate emergency? Yeah, I mean, I think 
the first thing that comes to mind is obviously like what the conversation that was happening before. I think it's part of our responsibility to bring voices to the forefront and an A&D, obviously the scope of the types of works that we do gives us a lot of flexibility to be able to focus on designers whose work actually do have an impact in the real world because that ultimately is what design you know, can do. So I think that we have a very special opportunity too to bring to the attention of the public, but also contribute within the disciplines of design to that conversation of, you know, what solutions are of the moment right now and just bring attention to certain things that might be underlooked and deserve more importance. I think that's one of the ways that we could do it. So we should turn to questions in a moment, but I have one kind of rapid fire thing I'd ask of all of you. You know, you all said such beautiful things about your time at the Johnson and that it really, it impacted your career path. And now as we're training, as I had mentioned, you know, undergraduates and graduate students at the Johnson, you know, what, what are the skills that the next generation of museum curators need, museum leaders need? What should we be instilling or um, encouraging in Cornell students? And they're listening because they're here from art history and art department in large numbers tonight. <laughs> so maybe Janet, I'll start with you. Oh, you're on mute and we don't yeah. want to miss right. it. Um, one thing that comes to mind is that, you know, it is important to, um, to uh, scholarly work is incredibly important, but another thing that is so important and something that I have seen shift um, in curatorial practice is um, is the importance of collaborative work, cross-disciplinary work, moving outside one's own expertise and being very open and, um, and actively seeking uh, the, um, you know, the, the input and expertise of, of others as we bring our projects to fruition. Oh, that's inspiring. <laughs> Just what we need to hear. Natalia, what would you say? I think, um, you know, one, I, what I love about the Johnson is the object-based learning and that you have to see the objects and be with the objects to be a great curator. Um, it's hard to do that virtually and it was, I think, very difficult for most of us to be separated from the works of art. But as um, Janet was saying, you know, it's very important to be collaborative and to wear many hats. I think I was I moved from academia to a curatorial position. And in academia, you know, you're the South Asianist. And at a museum, I'm the South Asianist, I'm the Southeast Asianist, I'm the Islamicist. And you have to talk with your colleagues and to work with community leaders. You're not just, you know, enclosed in a space, you're a public facing institution. And so I think a great skill is just being able to work with others and knowing that you're not, it's not just your name, you know, you have to work as a team. So interesting to think about curators as public intellectuals right, as researchers, as scholars, as curators in a, in a sense that's changing and widening, as you suggest. Um, Beth? Um, you know, just to follow up exactly on what you said, Jessica, I think, um, especially for those of us who are curators in uh, historic areas of art, um, I think relevance is something that really was not emphasized um, all those years ago when I it was about sort of connoisseurship and, you know, all those kinds of things. But I think it really is our obligation now to think about how we can connect with audiences, um, even in our scholarship. Like right now, I'm writing an article about unicorns in the Middle Ages, and I'm ending the article. Um, with a video piece by a uh, trans American um, Asian artist who has um, a little girl who goes to a circus and she, she feels robbed because it's not a real unicorn at the circus. And so she gets all the kids at the circus to start chanting, no unicorn, no peace, no unicorn, no peace. Um, because it's, you know, just how you bring justice to society. And I think that those kinds of things, looking forward and looking backwards are going to be more and more important to all of us. And as Natalia said, I'm not, you know, and I'm not an expert in um, contemporary art at all, but we all have to stretch ourselves in order to stay relevant. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Um, now we have physical museums and digital museums on top of it all. Um, Amerika, I'll give you the last tip. 
Yeah, I think for in my case, and this is kind of like a personal anecdote that I also want to add is um, one change that I've seen in two years of also working at the museum when I first started, um, first of all, I didn't expect at all to work in museums. Like with my background, it was not like in my preview at all. And it kind of just like slotted in perfectly. And when I started working at SFMOMA, one of the things that surprised me the most and it's changed since then is that I was the youngest person here. Like I was actually the youngest person in the curatorial division. I started working here when I was 24 and everyone around me was like older than me. They had like all these master's degrees. It, it was so specialized to the point where it was sometimes a little difficult to have conversations uh, like what we're talking about, like interdisciplinary. And I've seen that change a lot over the past two years. And I find that bringing in fresh voices also internally within any industry, not just um, the curatorial field, redefining what it means to like what are the check boxes that people have to you know fail to be able to have a certain role or do a certain type of work i've seen that kind of change a lot in the last two years and i think that's really crucial to be able to do really good work it's not just about uh collaborating interdisciplinary between fields it's also bringing in people whose skills might not at first seem like they apply to the curatorial studies area necessarily, but they're actually incredibly valuable. And I think we've been bringing in more and more diverse uh, people in the sense that people who have these crazy like uh, backgrounds working in different industries and in different places, and they bring such a critical new voice and fresh perspective that really forces us to re-examine and just shed a light on like how we've been doing it and ask ourselves why do we do it that way especially young people like they have that capacity to ask oh is it just the status quo are we doing this because that's the way that it's been done for 10 years or are we doing it because it's actually more efficient so i, I i'm really excited to see more and more people come out of uh the university but also so feeling really confident about um, not having to fit into certain molds to be able to contribute very significantly to these fields. So yeah, that's my contribution. <laughs> you know, I just think you've captured exactly why museum work is so energizing right now. It's challenging, but it's incredibly energizing in, in the speed at which it's changing and the voices, the new voices um, that are really pushing every institution in the right direction. Um, not just good work, our kind of best work together. So, you know, I'm, I know it's now nine o'clock. We started a little late and, you know, in the spirit of hearing more voices, I think we should take a couple questions uh, before we wrap it up. And my um, dear colleague, Courtney Campbell, who is head of development at the Johnson Museum, was going to select maybe one or two to read to the, to the group for our answers. Hi everyone, it's such a pleasure to join you all this evening. You know, as I've been reading the questions that came in ahead of time and while all of our panelists have been speaking, it seems that the theme of most of the questions are around what do museums look like after the pandemic? And what do you imagine the changes will be in terms of online exhibitions, in terms of designing spaces for in-person viewing of artwork? how we publicize exhibitions, and also the way you may interact with the education department within your museums. So I wonder if maybe we can take that subject and each of you could speak upon that as our last question. That's perfect. Courtney, thank you so much for that. Um, I know there are a lot of questions and to bundle that together and it's what's on all of our minds, right? Um, Beth, you've spoken to almost every aspect of that question in really exciting ways, but I would say, um, you know, you know you're not opening till 2021, but in answering that question, uh, even more into the future. Yeah, I think that um, the Getty really has been considering how to meld together the in-person experience, make it more um, sort of accessible, but also tie it together with what's happening virtually. So for instance, this exhibition that I was just talking about, um, Power, Justice and Tyranny, we had originally even talked about doing a voter registration drive um, at the Getty because there was a photography exhibition that was going to be called Election Eve. So getting people engaged by doing different aspects and relating it to exhibitions. Now, as I said, we're hoping to do a, um, a virtual version on 
on Google Arts and Culture, but also we've um, uh, suggested doing an Instagram um, sort of every week releasing one object with um, a sort of shortened label um, in the lead up to the election. So for me, it's all about how can we better tie together the virtual and the physical experience rather than having it be either or. Natalia. Oh, it's such a complex question because we still don't know what the future will look like and we're still adapting. Of course, I think it, we were always moving a little bit more virtual in terms of digitization and, and needing our objects to be forefront so people could study them and to be them to be accessible to a wider audience. Um, but as Beth said, there's something to be said about in person as well. And so I think we're still trying to find that balance of having exhibitions both be virtual parts of it and um, in person. And of course we can get artists to, more artists to speak, more connection around the globe and having all those conversations are so wonderful and so fruitful. Um, but there is something about the experience about being with the art that we don't wanna lose and how to do that without, um, but still being accessible. Cause I know, for instance, we had a lot of touch screens that we wanted to do uh, for people, for individuals, and that opened up the museum in different ways. And now we can't have that. So how do we actually make exhibitions tactile and uh, you know accessible in different ways as well as this, we're still thinking through? And America, what might you say? I mean, it's, it's really complex. I think I take more of the approach of exhibition design because that's probably what I've been exposed to the most. Um, and in our case, in A&D, every exhibition is so different because we only have like one big gallery. And so we're always trying to be really creative with our designs. And one thing that we've been doing a lot in the past is to try to get the physical space to be more of a forum. So we have been encouraging more of like in interactions in the physical space. I don't think that we want that to completely go away, but understanding that maybe just the way that people can gather in a space has to be different. Um, we're trying to explore ways in which maybe the discussions that we were trying to have in gallery can maybe move online. And so trying to um, capture the same kind of conversational quality that you would have in that gallery and maybe explore, um, not necessarily doing a virtual exhibition, but more so thinking about, is this something that could live as a hashtag in social media like you know like these kinds of avenues that still have that same sense of um kind of the way that we wanted people to talk about <laughs> a certain object in the room when they're next to someone else um and so these are kind of things that we're working with but also taking in mind that um there's limited resources too like we're not necessarily thinking of like revamping every digital uh, thing that we're trying to do but also just work with what we have and the existing platforms that are out there for us to use so social media being a really important one yeah and a powerful one janet how do you chart the future well um you know i i i think one thing is that we feel like we're going to need to really be nimble at SF MoMA and operating a museum during a pandemic. Um, I think sort of has prompted us to think about what it would be mean, what it would mean to open and close as the numbers might shift um, in our area and um, not nearly as complex as doing that on a university campus, but something that we're anticipating. The other thing that 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 we're that we know is almost certain to be the case is that our audience will be much more local than usual. You know, we won't be having um, the, uh, you know, the conventions um, bringing, you know, thousands of people to, um, to San Francisco every year. We will not have the same level of tourism. And normally, you know, half our audience on any given day um, uh, can... Oh, it looks like you're frozen. Um, I hope you don't... There you go. Uh, we're just, um, I'm not sure where, where we left off, but we're imagining that our audience will be much more local um, in, uh, you know, throughout this, the period of the pandemic. Um, you know, San Francisco is also pretty much a one industry town now. I mean, it's so dominated by the tech industry and now the tech workers are working at home. So there's a real shift in the, the feel of the city and, and the population of the city. And so we're, 
Um, what I think is especially important is that we really work with our community, with fellow arts organizations and other cultural organizations to do everything we can to fuel the role of, um, of the arts and culture in the revitalization of the city, because that will be really essential to, to San Francisco's future. Yes, essential. I mean, one of the things that I'll just share as we close about Cornell, you know, we had never had what I call kind of curricular gallery, gallery dedicated to selections made by faculty and students. And as we try to encourage physical distance, but also close looking at works of art and so many Cornell faculty teaching online large courses, we still want the students to come. So one by one by reservation, they're coming into this terrific transformed curricular gallery. So in a typical year we've worked literally about 400 Cornell classes from across 50 departments teach with the collections in the museum. So we had a lot of faculty to call on and we said, what, you know, what work drives your teaching? What's the most robust, you know, painting that can advance your conversation? What would it be if this sculpture were here and with this adjacency and this juxtaposition? And you walk in now and it's incredibly energetic. Um, to see not only the works of art talking to each other, but chemistry talking to romance languages and literature, you know, these different departments talking to each other. It's really thrilling. And we're in week two of the semester, early days, week two, and I don't think we'll ever go back. A curricular gallery is here to stay. <laughs> so for that, that space, I'm thrilled to see what happens and how it unfolds. And I'm just so delighted that all of you took the time to share your expertise with us. You share it in so many ways, but it's especially, it's a gift to share it with us, with the Johnson Museum and with Cornellians on the West Coast. And we have some other friends here tonight too. And so many of you listening in tonight, you have been generous with the Johnson Museum for many years, supporting our exhibitions, our annual fund, our publication. You know, the students that we talked about, they're doing great work, like, you know, so many of our panelists tonight because of the wonderful gifts that you've made to the Johnson. And we are just so deeply grateful, especially right now as we see um, what that does to the Johnson, that we can reopen to classes uh, with great imagination. And I think, uh, daring. So with that, I hope you all stay very safe. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our alumni colleagues, especially Nancy and Kate, um, and uh, take very good care. Thank you. Good night, all. Good night, Jessica. <laughs>